All right, everyone. Today I wanted to talk about the subject of bug out bags. Now, bug out bags are one of the most popular subjects in the prepping community, and it's one of the first things most people think of when they think of preppers. This is something I haven't really been compelled to talk about previously because, uh, well, given the current situation, most people are bugging in rather than bugging out. Um, and personally, my own plan is focused more on bugging in rather than bugging out. So I actually don't have a bug out bag ready to go. Um, like I said, that's not my plan A. It's also not my plan B. And really my plan C, if I do have to bug out, is to try to do so by vehicle. Um, so having a man portable bug out system isn't really very high in my priorities. Now I do have basically everything that I need to throw one together if I need to and I figure I can do that pretty pretty quickly and pretty easily. Um, because of that I'm gonna kinda walk you through some of the things that I would think about and consider in putting together a bug out bag. Um, some things I think would be wise to take into advisement. Um, this is in no way a comprehensive list and there are a lot of other people who are way more knowledgeable on the subject, so I would recommend doing some additional research, whether it's in print or online. Um, there's a wealth of information you can find out there. And so before you put together your bug out bag, do some additional research. Um, but this is designed to give you a, a brief introduction to some things that you need to consider and think about and include in your bug out bag. I'm actually doing this today because a good friend of mine reached out to me this morning and said that he had started his prepping journey, that he had purchased a, a pack, and that he was starting to put together a bug out bag. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad that he's starting to think about these things and starting to develop some plans. Um, so this video is in a lot of ways directed at him. You know who you are. and. Uh, but I figure it would be good for, uh, for everyone to just hear some thoughts and some things that you should think about with this issue. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is just conceptually bugging in versus bugging out. So I guess the very first thing is what is a bug out bag? Well, to put it simply, it's a bag with the supplies that you think that you'll need in order to bug out. Bugging out is basically a prepper term for getting out of Dodge. You know, if things get bad where you you are and you need to go somewhere else, get out of there, it's a bag that's going to sustain you while you're on that trip. Um, the reverse of that would be bugging in, which is basically just hunkering down where you are. That's my plan A um, and my plan B. could technically call it a bug out, but it's just to relocate to another location that's four miles away. So, you know, if need be, I can make multiple trips. Um, it shouldn't be an issue to use a vehicle to make those trips. Um, so really, as far as like an actual bug out, getting out of town, going a distance, um, that's somewhere farther down in my contingency plans. The, uh, when you start to develop a bug out bag, the first thing you need to do is you need to have a plan. Um, it's no good just to have a bag by the door and this idea of, oh, well, if things get bad, I'm just going to grab my bag and hit the road. Well, where are you going? How long is it going to take to get there, both in miles and in time? What's the terrain like um, in over your route? Uh, both the physical terrain, the environment, is it woodland, is it desert, is it city, is it rural? Um, also, what's the human terrain like? That's um, probably more of an issue in more densely populated areas, but, I mean, are you going through a very densely populated area? Are you going through, going to be going through farmland and rural areas? Um, how likely is it that you're going to encounter other people and how friendly are those people going to be to you? And these are all things you need to think about um, at the very beginning before you start to put together your bug out bag. Ideally, you should have a set location where you're trying to get to. You should know where that is. You should have studied the, the routes to get there. 
um, both by vehicle and on foot if you need to. Um, you should know where you can get water along the route, uh, where you might be able to seek shelter. You should know which areas are going to be more dangerous and which might be safer. You also need to have contingency routes if your primary route um, if there's, requires you to go over a bridge and the bridge is down. Um, these are all things that you need to take into account, so you need to have backups. Um, really, you need to have backups of everything. Redundancy is kind of a key concept in prepping in general, and it's something that we're going to talk about a lot, um, both in this video and I'm sure in future videos that I make, is the concept of redundancy, having backup plans. Um, there's a, a saying in the uh, shooting and prepping communities, uh, one is none and two is one. So basically that means if you have, if you only have one of something, it's probably going to break when you need it most, and then you're not going to have anything. So have backups. That way when your primary breaks, you have a backup to fall back on. When I'm organizing a bug out bag, I'm really kind of basing, I'm creating buckets of, not figurative buckets of my primary needs. What are the things that I need to be focused on for my survival? And then what do I have to fill that need? So your primary needs, most important is going to be shelter, and then water, food, fire, and then your tools, your clothing, um, and also medical goes in there. So, you know, the first thing that I think about is shelter. Now, I think of shelter on two different levels. You have your, your tent or your tarp or like uh, uh, improvised shelter that you can make. And then you have how do you actually keep warm within that shelter. So a sleeping bag or a blanket or something like that. In my personal experience, tents are too heavy, too bulky, and more trouble than they're worth. Um, you know, it can be nice to have a tent, especially during summer, but unless you have a vehicle to carry it, if it's a man portable system, I would recommend going with something that's more compact and lighter. A couple of good options there. The first one is, you know, just a tarp. Six by eight, six by six utility tarp. Um, you can get them in whatever color you want. So you could get a, a camouflage one, a more subdued one, blue one would be fine. Um, basically, you know, tarp is, can, you can make many different types of shelters out of a tarp. Um, it's very versatile. It has good, uh, water protection. Um, it'll protect you from the wind. So in a lot of my camping throughout the years, I've kind of relied on tarps and tried to stay away from tents. Um, tarps are large enough that you can make a, a fairly decent sized shelter um, for yourself or two or even three people. Um, the other option that I use a lot is just a USGI poncho. These things are also very versatile. It's not as waterproof as a tarp, um, especially if you, you know, if you're pushing up against it, a lot of times you'll get moisture seeping through. But, I mean, as you can see, it's camouflage. It's got grommets on the corners. Um, because of the hood in the center of the tarp, if you use it as a lean-to, you can tie a rope to the hood. You can see, I just keep this one, this hood tied up all the time because I never really use it as a poncho. It's primarily a shelter for me. You can tie a rope around here and tie that to some branches above you to help keep the center from sagging. So poncho is kind of my standard go-to and has been for quite a long time now. Um, you're also, when you're camping, you're going to want to have something above you to keep the rain off and something below you to keep moisture from coming up out of the ground. So, you know, with a tarp, because they're so large, a lot of times you can set it up above you and then just have the have the other end loose and pull it back under and lay on top of that. Um, you could have two tarps or two ponchos. Two ponchos is what I do a lot of times. 
Um, another option and something that I've done many a night is don't even bother setting up a lean-to. Just wrap your poncho around yourself, lay it down on the ground, lay down on it, pull it over the top of yourself, and just sleep like that. Um, it's not as comfortable. It's not as... Um, you're not going to keep as much of the rain off of you if it does start raining, but it's that's an adequate and very easy way to set up. And if you're really tired from a long day, walking, carrying all of this gear, a lot of times you don't really care exactly how comfortable it is. You just want to lay down and go to sleep. So those are all some things you can think about when it comes to shelter. The, uh, the second portion of that is what you're actually going to sleep in. So, of course, the obvious choice would be a sleeping bag. Um, sleeping bags are good, but they can be bulky and they can be heavy. Um, in my environment, living in Pennsylvania, if I have to go in winter, I'm going to take a sleeping bag. Because um, my other options are just not going to be warm enough for a Pennsylvania winter. However, if I'm going in summer... I generally don't mess with a sleeping bag because it's it takes up a lot of room in my pack. They can be rather heavy. Um, so the other options that I'll use in summer are number one, a wool blanket. Now make sure it's wool. Wool is really one of the best fabrics known to man. Um, there's very few things that even modern fabrics do better than wool in my opinion. Wool will keep you warm even when it's wet. Um, it does get heavy when it's wet, but it'll keep you warm when it's wet. It dries out very quickly. And, I mean, it's warm, you know, definitely when it's not wet. So I'm a big fan of wool, uh, both clothing and wool blankets. Um, I spent a lot of my teenage years as a Civil War reenactor, and wool blankets were what we used there. Um, so I've spent, you know, countless nights wrapped up in a, a rubber poncho, one that's a lot more basic than the one I showed you, and a wool blanket, just laying on the ground like that. Um, another option, which I know a lot of military guys swear by, and I've started to use in the past few years, and so far I like it, is the poncho liner, or the whoopee. So, you know, this is, this is camouflage, um, it's made out of synthetic materials. These do keep you pretty warm. I feel like in my experience so far, wool will keep you a little bit warmer, but this is lighter weight. Um, it's, you know, in subdued colors, and these will pack up very small. Um, so this is another good option. So moving on, the next most important thing is going to be water. You're going to need to carry water with you. Now, there's a few different ways you can do that. Some of the best uh, containers that I, in my experience, would be one of them is an old USGI canteen. Um, I mean, these things are great. Um, especially if you get it with a, a Molly pouch that you can strap right onto your pack. Um, these particular canteen covers, these are the newer military ones. I really like these because um, they have these two pockets on the sides. In this one, I have some water purification tablets and a lighter on this side, and I have some electrical tape on this side. Um, the other thing about the canteens is you can get the military-style aluminum cup that fits right on the bottom of the canteen and then you know you have the cup to cook with or eat out of or drink out of um, so that's another nice thing about a military canteen and there are also larger sizes for military canteens um, you don't have to use a military canteen um, you can use you know really any sort of uh, bottle of water but you're going to need to have some way to attach that to your pack um, or to have a strap to carry it. Another good option is the water bladder. Um, these are real practical because you can put these in your pack and then you feed the hose through your shoulder strap and then you have the water right there 
and it's very accessible. You don't have to take anything off or be reaching around trying to get to your water bottle. It's just right there when you need it. So water bladders are definitely nice. Usually I like to have both a water bladder and a canteen or some other sort of water bottle. Um, I'll use the canteen more for cooking usually or to refill my bladder if I need to. And then I'll, while I'm out during the day, I drink out of the bladder. Um, in addition to having containers, you're probably not going to be able to carry all the water that you need with you. Um, generally, the good figure is a gallon per person per day. Um, it's hard to carry more than a gallon of water. I mean, even a gallon is, can be kind of tough. So some other things that you're going to want are either water purification tablets. Uh, these are a, a two-part system where you have the purification tablet and then the other tablets that you put in that basically uh, take care of the taste of the chemicals from the purification tablet. Um, you can get those at any any place you can find camping supplies. You can get them at Walmart. Um, they're probably not the best option because you do have a taste and um, any particulate matter is still going to be in there. You're just basically killing any bacteria. Um, but it's a good lightweight compact option. Another option, only slightly larger and not much heavier, is a water filter. Um, now a lot of people like the life straws. I've never used a life straw, but um, some of the people who I uh, take advice from personally are not fans of the life straw for one thing because it's literally a straw and you're sucking you know water out of a pond or a stream. If that's a scuzzy pond or stream while well, you're getting your face down, right up in there. Also um, you know, because you're just sucking the water right up, it's harder to refill a bottle or a water bladder that you have. So I like the Sawyer, Sawyer Mini water filter. Um, they also have a larger size. The Mini will filter 100,000 gallons of water. Um, so that should be plenty for, you know, your bug out. Um, this is the filter itself. It also comes with a plunger to uh, clean it. Um, they come with a, a pouch that you can basically screw the filter right onto the pouch and then you fill the pouch up with water and you can drink straight out of it through the filter. They also have a straw um, that you can you know, put right on the filter. Um, you can put these filters in line with the hose on your hydration bladder. So you can put unfiltered water in the bladder and put the filter on it and then it'll filter it as you drink it. Um, so the Sawyer is kind of my recommendation for water purification. Although really, getting back to the topic of redundancy, I like to carry both the purification tablets and the water filter. And in my most of my experience so far, I also carry enough water that I don't need to procure more while I'm out. Now that may not be an issue, so I definitely suggest that you have a way to filter or purify water. But um, personally, like I've managed to avoid having to use these systems a whole lot so far. Next, you're going to have food. Um, this is a big area where you're going to have to figure out how long you're going to be out and how much food you're going to need to carry. Um, there's a lot of different options you have out there. For food, of course, there's the military MREs. Um, I mean, these are very good. You don't need a fire. They have, you know, you can heat them up with chemicals inside the pack. Um, there's also the freeze dried food that you can get. Um, this one, I believe, yeah, this one's self self heating, so you can you use a a chemical heater and just heat this one in the bag as well. So those can, can be good options. Um, I have some of those obviously but primarily in most of my experience I try to save those because I figure they're I mean they're expensive. Um, both of those options whether it's an MRE or the uh, civilian freeze-dried foods. So I have usually traditionally relied on you know the cheap options. Ramen, ramen's lightweight, 
Um, it doesn't have a lot of nutrients, but it'll it'll fill your stomach. Um, I can I'll just carry potatoes and boil potatoes. Rice in a bag is another good one. You can carry a lot of rice that can sustain you for a while. Um, beans are another one. Uh, just you know, five uh, well, one pound or five pound bag of beans. That's something that you can carry that will give you a lot of protein. Um, so those are all. Those are some of my preferred options. Um, is to carry more uh, the rather than a fancy prepackaged meal, just carry some basic. Um, necessities in you know in cloth bags or whatnot and boil it over the fire um, of course you have canned meat as well the canned meat or any canned goods those are heavy and can be awkward to carry so I wouldn't recommend relying on those but you know a couple of cans of spam or Vienna sausages or something um, will just give you a little bit of meat that will be preserved and carry well in your pack although it's going to be heavy the next thing under food is going to be your cooking utensils. Now, in my experience, you don't need a lot. Um, generally, I pretty much carry a cup or the, more recently, the uh, military style cup that I showed you earlier. Um, that's Generally, I do all of my cooking and eating out of this. You know, if it's rice, if it's potatoes, whatever, chop it up, put some water in the cup, and boil it. Um, just eat right out of there. That that's the lightest weight option. Um, I mean, they have you know, there's all sorts of mess kits, whether it's a military mess kit or a camping one you can get, but those are heavier and they're going to take up more room. So I try to keep it as simple and lightweight as possible. So I rely on a cup, a spoon and my knife um, not a kitchen knife my pocket knife or my belt knife and that's generally what I use for cooking utensils um, another thing you may want to consider would be a small frying pan um, this is one of the frying pans I used to carry reenacting um, of course nowadays you can get fancier ones with like a folding handle and whatnot but in my experience you know why spend the money for that when I have this. This is lightweight. Um, it's small, but it's big enough for a one-person meal. Um, but once again, you know, my main concerns are keep it light, keep it small. Um, so I'm not going to carry anything more than a small frying pan and a cup and a spoon. Um, another thing on food, I am a big fan of crunch bars try to see that out of the glare or cliff bars rather um, they pack a lot of calories and for as small as it is it actually fills you up pretty well um, there was a long period before I started my current diet where a cliff bar was my breakfast every day and I still have some cliff bars in my survival supplies um, just to give me some extra calories if I am in a survival situation um, you know, they're small, they're lightweight, and it's going to give you a large number of the calories that you need. I think a Cliff Bar is about 10% of your daily intake of calories. So moving on, and the next thing you're going to want to consider is fire. Um, you're going to need fire to, you know, warm yourself at night, um, to heat up your food, and just as a morale booster, fire um, definitely will help to raise your spirits. Now some considerations with that, if you're trying to hide, fire is probably not a good thing. Um, I mean, a fire can be seen at night for a long way. You can smell fire smoke, you can see smoke during the day. But if that's not a con consideration for you, you're gonna, you're, I mean, in any case, you're gonna need fire starters because fire is pretty basic to survival. It's what allowed humans to evolve to the point where we're at was the discovery of fire. Um, so first thing for fire, Bic lighter. They're cheap, they're light, they're small, and they're easy. You know, there's no re reason to make your first, your first line of fire starters something um, really old school and really involved like flint and steel or fire bow or anything like that. Just a big lighter. 
That's that's your first thing. Um, now, because Bic lighters don't, they'll get wet and then they won't be usable. So always have extra Bic lighters. You know, two minimum would be what I would recommend. And honestly, in a good bug out bag, you should have one or two in your pockets. You should have one or two in different parts of your pack. Hopefully inside a plastic bag or something where there'll be more watertight. Um, make sure that you build that redundancy in. And to further build on that redundancy, matches. Um, you can also get a ferro rod. Um, this is, you know, this is, will spark. Probably couldn't see it on the video, but that's, uh, you know, that's a more basic way that you can start a fire. But like I said, I would not rely on that as your first option because that's going to be a lot harder than using a big lighter. Um, to further go further with fire, I would pack a few candles. Um, candles can really be pretty useful in starting a fire. They can give you a little bit of extra light. Um, you can build a small camp stove out of a can and use some candles. So candles just have a lot of a lot of positive uses. They're not that heavy, so that's something that I would definitely recommend. Um, further down under the topic of fire is you're going to want some sort of light. You know, a head lantern. This is really good because it's hands-free. Um, this particular one is very bright. Um, some sort of flashlight. Um, see, this is my everyday carry flashlight. You know, it's small, fits in my pocket. Um, but you're definitely going to want some sort of flashlight or head lantern or both. You may also want another, like a, you know, lantern that you can sit down or hang up um, to give you some more light. That's going to be up to you if you want to deal with that extra weight and the size that's going to take in your pack. Um, but a flashlight and or a head lantern, that's something that you definitely need. So to move on from fire, next category is tools. You are going to want to have some tools. Um, when, whenever you're bugging out. Now the most basic tool that you're going to need is going to be a knife. Um, pocket knife of some sort. This is my everyday carry pocket knife. Take it everywhere. Um, really I have since I was a teenager. Now I would recommend having both a pocket knife and a fixed blade knife. Now a couple of good options for fixed blades. Um, I have a bunch of fixed blade knives and my two preferred options would be the Mora knife. These are very, I mean they're inexpensive but they're also very high quality Swedish made knives. Um, this one is carbon steel. Um, so carbon steel will keep a better edge and it's easier to sharpen. Um, this thing is wicked sharp and it has a nice rubber grip as well. Um, the problem with carbon steel is it'll rust. So some people prefer stainless steel, but just be aware that while stainless steel isn't gonna rust, it will dull faster and it will be harder to put a good edge on it. Um, my other preferred option for a knife is a K-bar. Um, this is one of the mini K-bars. I think it's a five and a half inch blade. Um, the standard K-bar is about two inches larger than this one, but I've actually found this to be a perfect size. Um, I've never needed a larger knife than this, but this is a superb knife. Um, it's very sturdy, and really it's done everything I've needed it to do for over 15 years. Um, so I do highly recommend K-bar knives. Additional tools that you'll want to consider is you'll want you to get yourself a good multi-tool. Um, I'm a fan of Gerber multi-tools. I used to use uh, some basic Leatherman that was like a promotional thing that had my father's company's logo on it and he gave it to me. Um, it was adequate when I was in Boy Scouts, but a lot of the other people I was in Scouts with had the Gerber multi-tools and I always definitely preferred those. Um, this is a Gerber diesel. Um, this is a pretty large one. I have another similar style of Gerber that's slightly smaller that I carry every day. 
Um, this one is more my camping survival one um, that goes with that gear. One of the things I like about these is they will, well, not supposed to throw it, but you can flick it open with one hand um, and then you know you have the pliers there, there's a wire cutter down there, and then you have a knife blade in here, you have a few different sizes of screwdrivers, you have a bottle opener and a can opener. This one also has um, scissors and there's a small saw blade in here um, and it also has a file. So a lot of tools that can definitely come in handy when you're bugging out or in the woods generally. Um, there's also, this one is a Gerber Crucial. Um, this one doesn't have the one-handed opening. It opens in the more traditional manner. It's a lot smaller, but it does have some of the most basic essential things that you're going to need. There's a knife on there, a couple screwdrivers. It even has a, a seatbelt cutter, so that's pretty nice. Um, but I'm a big fan of Gerber products uh, when it comes to the multi-tools. Um, they also make great knives and a bunch of other outdoor tools. Um, but those are some of my preferred options. Um, to move up a size, you're also going to want some sort of hatchet. Um, this is pretty basic old school hatchet. I think we got this at an 18th century fair. Um, but you may need to chop wood. Um, it's highly likely if you're starting a fire, you're going to need to chop wood. Also, look for something that has a, a blunt edge on the reverse. So that way, if, you, you know, if you're setting up a lean-to and you have some tent stakes, you can pound those in. Really, you can use it as a hammer for whatever you need to hammer. Um, so that's something I highly recommend. Um, another option, and this is what I actually typically carry rather than a hatchet, is the survival machete. Um, this is an Ontario survival machete. This one, um, I've used it for a long time. It's you know seen a lot of rough use, and this thing, I mean, it's it's held up well. It's you know solid chunk of steel, full tang. Um, the nice thing about this, you can use it to chop with. Um, typically, if you're chopping wood, you're going to want to you know you set the the piece of wood that you're chopping upright you'll get one whack in it and get it get the blade stuck in there and then you take another smaller piece and pound on this side of the blade to chop um, but you can also you know hack it brush with it it's got a saw blade on the back and what I really like about with it is you can because of this blunt edge you can dig with it um, it makes the perfect size cat hole for your number two needs. Um, so that's one thing that I really like about that because that's, I mean, that's something else you're gonna have to think about is where are you gonna go? And it's definitely better both from a, you know, sanitary perspective and from a not being found perspective to be able to bury your excrement. So this is perfect for that as well as chopping wood, use it as a pry bar. Um, it has a plethora of uses. Um, if you end up going the hatchet route, you may want to consider a small shovel um, for that purpose of uh, digging a cat hole or if you're going to um, bear, dig a fire pit or whatever. Um, I prefer the survival machete because it's just one tool. It is heavier than the hatchet, but it's one tool versus the hatchet and a shovel. Um, also on the subject of tools, if a firearm is part of your bug out kit, um, and I'm not really going to get into whether it should be or what type of firearm it should be, I may address that in the future, but right now I'm just going to say if that is part of your kit, you're also going to need extra ammunition and cleaning supplies. You know, you need some patches, some gun oil, something to clean the bore of the firearm, you need a brush to clean off the bolt face, um, so those are other things for you to consider. Moving on, we have uh, clothing. Now, clothing is, you know, a pretty obvious thing. Um, some stuff you're going to want to consider. You're not going to want to pack more than you absolutely need. Um, pretty much, I go with 
one set of outer layer of my clothing. So like a, a jacket and pants and boots. And then I'll have multiples of underwear, socks, and long underwear. Um, you're definitely going to want long underwear. Even in the summer, if it gets cold at night where you're at, you're going to want some long underwear to be able to put on when you sleep. Um, I rec Once again, I recommend wool for, you know, if you have a sweater or a shirt. Um, if you have a flannel shirt, try to get one that's actual wool and not cotton flannel. Um, but you're going to want to think about, you're going to want to think about how cold it's going to get at night. Don't just think about what it's like during the day and pack around the worst weather conditions that you could experience while you're out. So in the middle of winter, you're going to want a lot more layers and a lot more heavier clothes. Um, during the summer, you can get away going lighter when it comes to clothing, but you're still going to want you're still going to want to be prepared for the temperature dropping significantly at night. Um, along with that, even in the middle of summer, definitely a beanie. Um, now, when it's summer, you're not going to wear this during the day, most likely, but this is going to be your sleeping cap. Having a beanie on when you sleep is going to do a whole lot to keep you a lot warmer and a lot more comfortable. So that's definitely something you're going to want to consider. And then finally, you're going to have medical. Uh, medical is something that all too often get, gets overlooked, but it's one of the most important things. Um, there's a few different categories that you're going to want to think about in this. One is if you have any essential maintenance medications that you take every day, you're definitely going to want to have those with you. Um, you know, bugging out is no time to be skipping your medications and compromising your, your health. Also, you're going to want to have some, you know, just a basic first aid kit. I would start just thinking like the most simple and likely things that you are to encounter. So have some band-aids, some neosporin for the cuts and scrapes that you're definitely going to get if you're preparing food around a campfire, if you're setting up camp just as you're out during your day. You're most likely to have very small cuts and scrapes, but you're going to want to treat them because if those get infected, they're going to become a much bigger issue. So have some Neosporin or some other sort of antibiotic and some Band-Aids. To go up a level, you're going to want some moleskin for your feet. If you start getting blisters on your feet, you're not going to have a good time walking. You're not going to have a good time bugging out. So definitely have some moleskin. I would also highly recommend having some gauze um, for larger abrasions, um, larger cuts that you may get. Along with that, some sort of tape. It could be medical tape. It could be electrical tape or duct tape. But basically, you'll want to wrap or pack the wound with gauze and then tape it up with something. Um, to go beyond that, you may want to consider um, remedies for bug bites and or snake bites and or broken bones. Um, at this point, you're getting into size and weight considerations and also what do you know how to use and what is a vetted product that you can actually rely on and not just some, you know, internet cure-all remedy that might end up doing more harm than good. Um, finally, you may want to consider some sort of actual military-style trauma kit. Um, this is one of my trauma kits. This is pretty much tailored for gunshot wounds. There are more comprehensive kits out there. This is something I put together um, myself. I have a couple of these set up very similar. Um, some things I don't have in here are a chest decompression needle um, and a uh, nasal airway. Those are both things I don't have any training on, so I'm not really comfortable using them on myself or someone else. There is a school of thought that even if you don't have the training on it, you should still carry it because someone around you may have training on it. Um, so I may incorporate that into my kit someday and hopefully I'll get training on those someday and then I'll definitely incorporate them. Um, but basic things I have in here are first a tourniquet. Um, this, is, this is actually a Chinese knockoff cheap Amazon tourniquet. Do not get one of these. The reason I have this, and maybe you can see the change of light, 
is training. This is my training tourniquet. I am not going to rely on this one because, like I said, it's a cheap Chinese one and it'll break when I need it. So this one is simply to teach other people how to use a tourniquet and to practice myself. Um, you should get an actual North American Rescue and make sure that's a legit North American Rescue cat tourniquet. There are some other options out there. There's the Soft Tea tourniquet. Um, that's also good. But you definitely avoid a cheap Amazon knockoff. Um, the other things I have in here, um, medical tape, gloves. I have a Israeli bandage. Um, this is a compression bandage. Basically, it's pre-sealed. You rip it open, you wrap it around a wound. It has a pressure bar that you can twist to get some extra pressure and then pin. Um, I also keep some duct tape in here rolled up. Um, you know, like I said, you can improvise a bandage with that. I have some quick clot gauze. So this is gauze that's treated with a quick clot clotting solution. Uh, so that way it'll help to clot the blood and hopefully stop the bleeding faster. And I also have some chest seals. I believe these are a halo. A set of halo chest seals. So if you're encountering a sucking chest wound, you you know rip the clothes off, stick this on the skin, and that'll seal up the chest um, to keep that air from escaping. Now you don't have to well, I like to have a trauma kit. Um, I'm not going to tell you that you definitely need one. That's up to you, um, whether you think that you need something that comprehensive or not. Um, like I said, this one's tailored to gunshot wounds. And for a general bugging out medical kit, I would want to have some more... Uh, generalized things like the band-aids, the moleskin, the neosporin, things for your more common everyday injuries in addition to this. Um, but this is just to you know give you some ideas and some starters and, um, and things to think about. But definitely get some more opinions, um, do some additional research before you put your own kit together. Um, finally, under the heading of medical, and this doesn't fit entirely under medical, but since I said I like to put things in nice, easy to organize buckets, um, personal hygiene items. You're going to want a toothbrush, you're going to want some toothpaste, you're going to want some soap, um, and some toilet paper. You know, those are all very essential things that you're going to need while you're bugging out. Um, Additionally, I would recommend some wet wipes. Um, you know, these are for sensitive skin and whatnot. If you're not able to take a shower and you're getting all grimy hiking all day, um, these will come in handy. Um, basically, just help you to feel a lot more comfortable and a lot less miserable during this miserable experience. Um, some final things that I like to have some hot hands. Um, I do like to have a Mylar space blanket. However, this is kind of a last resort thing. Um, these are, you're never gonna get it folded back up like this once you unfold it to use. And it's probably gonna rip on you when you use it. So like I said, this is kind of like a last resort, um, something extra, another layer of redundancy that I like to have. Um, also, I have some animal snares um, for you know catching moles or rabbits or whatnot um, that's going to be a lot more efficient way to procure food than hunting although it does require you to be tied to that area where you place the snares uh, for a period of time so it's not something that you can just you know grab it and then be on your way um, also you're going to need rope I recommend 550 paracord. Um, this is lightweight. It's very easy to use. Um, it's durable. 
And in my experience, it's, you know, some of the best, most versatile rope that you're going to have for most of what you're going to need. Also, I would recommend some fishing line and fishing hooks, um, once again, to help you try to procure some food. Um, I think that's most of the basics there. Now, of course, you're going to have to tailor all of this to your own situation, um, both your the plan that you develop for bugging out and your environment. Um, you know, what works for me might not be sufficient for you if you live in the desert or you live in somewhere that's significantly colder or somewhere significantly warmer. Um, so you're going to have to kind of, you know, take what I'm saying and think about how you can apply it to your particular situation. Don't just do what I do. Um, pretty much all of the details about what kit you select, what you decide to carry is going to be dependent on your own situation and your location. And the final thing I want to talk about is size and weight considerations. That's something very important that you're going to have to consider when you're deciding what pieces of kit to get is how big and how heavy every item that you're selecting is. And you're going, you're going to want to look at that item both by itself as how heavy is this, how much room does it take up, and then when you have everything together, assess it again and assess it as a whole. How big is all of this together and how heavy is all of this together? And that'll help you to figure out what might be unnecessary, um, basically figure what's just gonna be more trouble um, to carry with you than the value that it'll add to your kit. Um, so size and weight considerations is a pretty crucial concern. Um, I think that's most of what I have for this uh, quick, I guess, 45 minute introduction to bug out bags and some of the things you're going to need to think about and consider. I hope you got some use out of this and found it beneficial. If you did, make sure you hit like and share and uh, subscribe to the channel. Um, if you have any recommendations on things you'd like to, on things you would do differently, you can put those in the comments below. And uh, I guess until next time, take care.